Hey everybody, it's Vanessa, the Crafty Gemini, and welcome to Whip Wednesday, episode number 93. Let's take a moment and make sure everyone can see me and hear me and that all the technology is working. I have my chat pulled up here. I see a bunch of y'all are on. Thank you everybody who's wishing me a happy birthday. As y'all know, if you got my email, my birthday is tomorrow. I'm a June 1st baby, and I am turning the big four zero. So we'll talk a little bit about my birthday sale that we have going on this week. Uh, let's see, Debbie's tuning in from California. We got Mel in the house from Ontario. Hi, Tracy. Thank you. Uh, who else? Hi, Margie's tuning in from Wisconsin. Who do we have here? I have a little bit of a glare on my iPad screen here. So let me readjust this real quick. Hey, Joan tuning in from Ontario, uh, Canada. We got Karen from Ohio's in the house. Okay, great. There's a bunch of y'all already on here. Good, 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 good. Okay, so we have a couple of questions. I went ahead, we're gonna keep it kind of short today since I am still prepping and packing all my stuff up. We have a sewing retreat this week. Um, this is the third retreat I've hosted this year and this is a bag sewing one. So we're gonna be making a couple different bag projects and uh, we're still putting together the kits because they have several different pieces of you know, zippers, hardware, fabrics, interfacings, and all that. But we're definitely going to have a full house. So if you're going to be on social media this weekend from June 2nd through the 5th, I'll definitely be posting pictures and some little video clips and stuff so y'all can see what we're up to. And then safe travels to those of you that are coming down here to North Central Florida for the retreat. Okay. So let's go ahead and get started. I pulled four questions out. Uh, they're pretty straightforward, so we're going to cover those pretty easily here. And then I wanted to talk a little bit about the birthday sale that we have going on. If you're not subscribed to our email newsletter list, make sure that you go uh, to craftygemini.com, which is our website, and you can add yourself to our email newsletter list because that is the best way to keep in touch with everything we have going on here at Crafty Gemini. We send you know any sales, flash sales that we do, all the information about our sewing and quilting retreats is always sent out via email as well. So sometimes, you know, people find out about it after the fact and it's probably because they weren't on our email list. So definitely do that if you want to stay in the know. Yes, Tamara says, I can't wait to get to this retreat. She's going to be heading down from Chicago, so that's awesome. I know we have uh, one retreater, Tammy, who has come to one of our retreats in the past, and she's coming to Florida from Hawaii. So she has quite the trek, so safe travels to you too, Tammy. All right, so... Let's go ahead and get started. So real quick, we have a sale going on at craftygemini.com slash shop. We have hundreds of both physical products and digital courses, online club memberships on all kinds of stuff dealing with garment sewing, bag sewing, and quilting, okay? The entire website is 20% off only until Sunday. So it's my birthday week. I'm turning 40 tomorrow, so I decided, you know, since I still feel like I'm 20, let's go ahead and do a 20% off sale off the entire website. The only thing that's not included is the sewing machines. That's it. Everything else, both physical and digital products, is 20% off. You don't need a coupon code. You don't have to enter anything. It's already populated so that it will take the 20% discount off of anything you have in your cart. That doesn't include the sewing machines. And then uh, it's going to be automatically applied to your shopping cart. So have fun shopping this weekend. We want to thank everybody for their support. I know a lot of you have been following me since I was in my mid-20s, since we've been at this for about 15 years. So y'all have seen me go through a ton of years, right? Over a decade already. And um, we're super proud and happy about everything that we've done here with Crafty Gemini. And I'm looking forward to see, you know, what else is in our future. So thank you everybody for your continued support. Gloria says, happy birthday, 40. You look 20. Well, thank you, darling. I feel 20. <laughs> and uh, all right, great. So let's go ahead and give everybody the over my shoulder camera shot here. And we're going to get started with the first question. Make sure this is uh, where I want it. Okay. The first question is from M, somebody with a letter M name, entered a question here that says, how do I increase or decrease a bag pattern? And so this is actually a pretty common question that we've received over the years. And I always mention this tip, but you know, not everybody is uh, watching the videos or in involved in the courses and things like that. So I'm going to share it with y'all here. I went ahead and pulled up one of my bag patterns. This is my Flora crossbody bag, and I have the little sample here. This uh, course is not actually available yet for uh, for people to sign up for because we just made this project in our last mini bag of the month club. So it's a nice small little uh, crossbody bag. It has a magnetic slap closure and then it's just an open compartment here on the inside. So really cute. This is an option that I give students so that you can do either solid chunk of fabric here 
or use the template pieces to create a three panel here on the front, which you can see I use some soft vinyl for, um, for this side here. I have another one where I use the soft vinyl on the flap as well, but you can mix and match and it can, the whole thing can be made out of cotton fabric also. Okay. So this bag, right in the course, when people sign up for it, they get access to my PDF template patterns. Now, this is how I do it and how a lot of the bag designers will do it. So first I'm gonna share with you the tip on how you would increase or decrease it if you're basing the pattern, if it's an, a PDF pattern, okay? So if it is a PDF, oftentimes you will find, here's my ruler, oftentimes you will find that there's some type of a scale square here that allows you at home when you're printing out this pattern to make sure that your printer settings are set correctly. Okay. If you've been involved in my clubs or courses, you know that I usually will tell you in the first videos, if it needs a PDF, you need to go ahead and download the file, save it to your computer. Then when you open it, you open it in Adobe PDF reader, which is a free PDF reader. Instead of just double clicking the file and opening it up on a web browser, because sometimes that can tweak the proportions of the PDF. Okay. So you download the PDF file first, save it to your device, open it in Adobe PDF Reader, and then from there, you set your printer settings to print at 100% scale. And so one way to double check that, if it's a multi-page PDF pattern, I will tell my students just print out page one so you can make sure the settings are, correctly, are, are set correctly before you start printing out all the pages, right? Well, in my patterns, I usually will have this one inch square box. And that means that if you did the steps that I just went over and you print out page one, to test it out and make sure that it was printed the way that I, the designer, designed it to be, I tell my students to just grab a ruler and go ahead and measure that square. If that little um, scale square there measures exactly one inch by one inch, then you know that you have printed the template pieces to scale. And then that means, okay, don't touch anything leave the settings just as they are and print the remaining pages and you know everything will turn out correctly, okay? Sometimes if you just open up a PDF file in a web browser page and print from there, it oftentimes will shrink it. So you'll go to measure the one inch square and it will be like seven eighths or five eighths, right? And then you know, okay, it's not one inch by one inch square, so I need to adjust my printer settings to make it be one inch square because if this square here is one inch by one inch then that means the template piece i'll be cutting is the right size otherwise sometimes i'll have students that they finish making the project and they'll say you know my bag looks a lot smaller than yours and oftentimes that's where it, they got messed up but if you want to do that intentionally you can also instead of setting your printer settings to print at 100 percent if you wanted to make this bag i mean and this one is not the best example because it's kind of small already but say you wanted to make like a mommy and me bag set and you wanted this for a grown-up and you wanted to make it slightly smaller for a little toddler to match right with the same fabrics so she can match her mom or whatever then you could set your printer settings to instead of printing at 100 percent to print at 90% or 92%, okay? So that will basically proportionally decrease the size of the template. And I know a lot of people forget about that. You can always do the same to increase or to decrease it or to increase it. So say you wanted the bag to be a little bit bigger. You could do the same thing, but in the opposite direction, right? Instead of 100% scale, you can print it at 108%, 110%. I would say just be careful that you don't go way big. Like you're thinking, well, I want it a lot bigger. Let me go 150%. That's going to increase the entire thing by one and a half times. It's going to be huge. So you can play around with the settings, okay? Maybe print out the one page first, especially if this is for the front and back panels, like this one is for this Flora cross body bag. And you can kind of cut it out and say, okay, that's, that's a good size, you know? But that at least gives you a range that you can play with your printer settings to make sure that you have a range there to work from, okay? So make a prototype maybe. And I would, if you do do that, and you find that you have another size that you really like to make, or in the case of those of you that maybe sell your bags that you make from my patterns, just go ahead when you do print it out, put on the template piece, the percentage that you printed it at. So if you print it at 107%, write it in there so that you don't mistakenly start mixing your template pieces and use one that's at 100% with another one that's at 107, and then you're wondering why your seam allowances don't match, okay? So be careful with that and just take notes. But when it's a PDF pattern, you can always do that. 
decrease or increase just by adjusting the percentage of your printer settings, all right? Rosa says that her HP printer doesn't give her the option to select a percentage. Well, another option, if you don't have that, is I know some uh, students who don't even have printers at home will take the file on a little jump drive or a thumb drive and take it to their local uh, print shop, and you can tell them what percentage you want that file printed out at. So that is also an option. Other times, if, for example, the templates are he are like this, designed to print out on 8.5 by 11 sheets of paper here in the U.S., if you wanted to make this huge, like way, way bigger, but it, it ends up distorting the template to the point where like you need to print it on an 11 by 17 inch sheet of paper, like legal size paper, then you may want to do that. Take the file itself on a little jump drive or thumb drive, take it to a print shop and tell them, hey, I want this printed at this scale, and it'll need to be printed at 11 on 11 by 17 paper, okay? So try that. Hopefully that'll, you know, help. Or if you have somebody that has a printer that can adjust their settings, you can try that too. All right. Uh, Renee says, I enjoyed making the Flora crossbody bag and want to make another one a little larger. Perfect. So if you have a printer that allows you to do that, Renee, you'll definitely be able to do it with this. Okay. Oh, that's so funny. Patrice says, wow, I just submitted basically the same question on the form today. So for those of you that don't know, there is a link to a Google form document in the description box below this video and in the caption as well, if you're watching us on Facebook, where you can uh, click on there and then submit a question that you'd like for me to answer in a future episode of Whip Wednesday. So we're always taking new questions. They can have anything to do with anything that I do. Sewing, quilting, zippers, bags, all the kind of stuff, notions, interfacing, starch, whatever it is and then my team goes in and classifies them by topic so every week when I'm preparing for whip Wednesday episodes we can go in there and pull some questions to answer awesome okay let's see Doo -doo -doo. Gloria is asking do I sell books with some of my patterns I don't I don't have any books yet all right okay so that is that, and hopefully that helps some of y'all. If you have a PDF pattern, any PDF pattern, if they have a scale square here, you print at 100% if you want it to match the proportion that the designer intended for the pattern, or you can increase or decrease, okay, if you want to make it a little bit bigger or smaller. And again, I would say start off with smaller increments. I know some people, like for my fleece hat pattern that has ear flaps, that's a very popular pattern. It's a free PDF download. A lot of people make them, give them to the homeless, make them for kids of all ages, a lot of people will increase that. If they have someone that has a larger head, they will increase the proportions on that to be able to keep all the template pieces proportional, but all increased by the same rate, and they'll do like 110%, 108% in uh, for the printer settings. Okay, next one. I have two questions here that are kind of similar, so we'll answer them both together. Joe is asking... I normally use the lines on my cutting mat to cut my fabric, but have been trying to cut my fabric using the ruler. I saw one of your videos using a ruler, but I'm not sure that I'm doing it correctly. Any helpful tips, please? And thank you for all you do for us beginning quilters and sewists. So you're welcome. And then the other question is from a Jojo who, resp who um, submitted a question that says, what is the best way to cut fabric using your ruler to cut the fabric or the lines on the cutting mat? Okay, so let's talk a little bit about that. I have two of my rulers here. These are the Crafty Gemini 5 inch by 10 inch rulers. They're an awesome, awesome size. And again, remember I have my birthday sale going where you get 20% off everything in the shop. That includes my rulers too, tools and notions. Everything in the shop, whether it's a physical product or a digital product, uh, except the sewing machine. So everything else we sell is on sale for this weekend only for my birthday sale. Okay, um, let's see. Do, do, do. All right, so these two rulers here, and let me grab a chunk of fabric. Let's talk a little bit about cutting fabric. So first, I have a piece of fabric here. Let me make sure it's in the shot. And I have seen over the years a lot of people who cut like this. They'll have a chunk of fabric and say the pattern calls for a piece that measures, I don't know, three inches by six and a half, okay? And they'll start kind of going like this, and they'll cut, they'll say, okay, three inches. So then they'll start here. And then they're kind of like now six and a half. And then they'll put it like this and say, okay, six and a half is here. So they'll kind of extend this up towards the six and a half. And, and so the fabric is still connected, okay? And then they'll turn it and say, okay, let's see, this is three. 
by six and a half. So I'm going six and a half here. And then they'll kind of like cut it like this. And they end up with a ton of like weird off cut fabric pieces. Then they'll come in and cut another chunk like out of the middle here. And it's just like all over the place. Yes, you probably still end up with close enough correctly cut pieces, but it's very easy. And I have seen it happen in person in my retreats, in my classes and everything, where because you still have fabric all around the piece you're trying to cut out, you're getting confused as to where you're measuring from. And then they end up like, oh, I cut it half of an inch short. Well, that's wasted. Let me turn it this way and try and cut it again. And it's just like, there's a lot going on. And I feel like it doesn't have to be that hard. So a couple things, start your fabric, press it. That's always going to be my number one way to prepare fabric. If you have fabric that has a little bit of wrinkles like this and hasn't really been starched, even if you cut accurately, chances are it's going to be a little bit bigger or smaller. Okay. If I have this little chunk right here, that's lifted up. Well, it doesn't measure the same as when it's smoothed out flat. So if I'm basing it like that and I'm cutting off of like what I see, I'm going to end up with a piece that's a little bit bigger because after it's cut and I go into press, it's going to stretch out a little bit and I'm adding, you see how this is on this line right here. If I flatten it out, I've added an eighth of an inch to the length. When I let it go, it shrinks back up to the line. And when I pull it, it's an eighth of an inch over. So if you don't have your fabric pressed flat and crisp, you're already starting off on the wrong foot especially if you're a quilter, right? If you're making a bag, an eighth of an inch like that is not really going to matter too much unless it's in an area where it needs to match up perfectly with a few things. If this is patchwork for quilting, especially maybe a quilt block or a section of a quilt block that incorporates a lot of different seam intersections, you may run into some serious issues even by just having a little bit of an eighth of an inch bigger on one side than the other. It can really throw things off. So number one is going to be, <laughs> Renee says, OMG, I have done that. Yes, I know. Many of you do. Now remember that I am one who my most favorite part of quilting, of the entire quilting process is cutting. So cutting is my jam, okay? I love, love, love cutting. I love precise cuts. I love precise math. That's my favorite thing. So let's see. Yes, Tamara says accurate cutting is everything. Your techniques are how I learned to do it right 10 years ago. I love to hear it. So here's what I would do. First of all, I'm one who collect a lot of scraps, but I like to have clean cut pieces for my scraps. So like this right here, it just bothers me to fold it up and put it in my stash because this chunk is sticking out of it. So I'm one that prefers to clean up my edges and we're going to pretend that this is pressed because I don't have my iron plugged up right now. But what I'm going to do is place the weight of the ruler on it to kind of smooth it and make it. And that way I can kind of ensure that it's flat underneath the ruler. But again, I'm a starcher. And a presser, y'all know, before we make any cuts, I starch and I press it flat, okay? So I cleaned off just a little bit of that edge to make sure that it's straight. Then I will go in, and depending on what the measurement is, I will either use one or two rulers. Because I'm right-hand dominant, and say I cleaned off this edge, if I want to immediately start measuring my cut measurement over, I'm going to place a ruler here, which means then that I'm not cutting here with my right hand and I definitely don't want to crisscross my hands to cut with my dominant hand, okay? So if I start cleaning off on the right side edge of my fabric and I begin to measure from that right side edge over, I already automatically know I need to do two rulers. So that means I need to grab my second ruler, okay? Because I want to be cutting to the right side of my ruler because I'm right hand dominant. If you're left hand dominant, then you're going to go like this. If you need to cut a two inch strip, you're going to align the two inch mark off your ruler with the right side edge. And then you would hold the ruler with your right hand and you would cut with your left here. Okay. For left handers, easy peasy. And of course this uh, rotary cutter, I think we might have some left in the shop. These are expensive. So this actually my 20% off birthday sale would be a great deal for you to grab one of these. If there are any in stock, I'm not sure, but this unscrews. And instead of having the blade to the left side, which is for right-handed people like this, you swap the blade out to the, the other side and that's how you would cut this way. So these are more ergonomic rotary cutters that we carry. And, uh, you can use it both for left hand or right hand dominant people. Okay. So you would go like this and cut right here if you were left-handed. Because I'm right-handed and I don't want to cross over and have this not very safe way of cutting, I use a second ruler and I bump them up together, okay? 
Now I know that where the two rulers are meeting is where I want to cut, right? So again, if I'm left-handed, I don't need the second ruler. I can just cut here. But because I'm right-hand dominant, I'm going to bump up this ruler, and where they're meeting is where I want to cut. So what does that mean? That means I can get rid of the right-hand ruler, and now I can position my blade to the right side of that left-hand ruler. Does that make sense? So here would be where I would cut, and that's my two-inch strip, okay? So let's go over a, um, a, another cut from here instead of doing what we did here, and I'll share with you my tips real quick. Uh, let's see. Let me just pop into the chat real quick. Joan says, cutting is my worst part. I need to know how to do that properly. And it does. It takes practice because there's a lot of numbers, but it also does help to have some really good rulers that allow you to measure up instead of counting. You don't know how many times I see people go like this. They line it up and then they go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right? And then you're counting and you're like the halfway point is kind of halfway. And so they cut like that. I don't like to do that for a couple of reasons. One, because I started off as a quilter and it's not as precise as I personally would like it to be. Two, be careful with the mat that you're using because if, if it is an older mat, you'll want to take a proper ruler, like a, a ruler that's made to scale that you know that the measurements are right, and measure the boxes and the lines on your cutting mat, okay? Because sometimes on this cutting mat, I mean, this is a newer mat for me. It doesn't look like it because I cut a lot on it, but the lines are kind of thick. So sometimes if you measure to the left of the line, in the middle of the line, to the right of the line, it can vary your measurements, okay? So that's, again, one of the reasons I don't like to use the squares on the cutting mat for precision cutting. However, if I just know I need roughly a 10 inch by 12 inch piece, oh, you can totally use the boxes because you're not cutting to precision yet, right? We're just cutting it down to a smaller size for whatever it may be, maybe a bag panel or something that you know is going to get trimmed up at a later step. So yes, you can use these to cut. For me, I use it for rough measurements, not for precision. When it's a cut that needs to be very precise, I absolutely use my rulers. And then I also make sure that they are rulers that are to scale, meaning the measurements are correct. I've seen people in the past put two rulers side by side and the quarter inch line is like way off of one. It's like either way smaller or a lot bigger. So you want to make sure also that you're using accurate rulers, especially if you're a quilter. Okay. So let's see. Um, Joan says she has the same kind of rotary cutter as I do. I love it. Awesome. Um, Amanda's asking, how do you properly start your fabric? So for me, I just use whatever heavy finish I have on hand. I will spray the fabric, heat up my iron, and just with the heat of a dry iron, I will just press it flat on an ironing board. And that's just how I do it. Some people will spray it and kind of drape it over a clothes rack to let it dry. And then they press. There's a lot of different ways to do it. I just spray, give it about 30 seconds for the cotton fabric to absorb the starch, and then I just hit it with a, the dry iron, okay? All right. Oh, Lavana says, I love your 10-inch ruler. I might have to get a second one. It does help to have two because they're a great size, and I like these because you can also cut your pre-cuts. So five inches to here, and I have a solid line that cuts across so you see where the five-inch is. Of course, it also has a five on either side, and then it measures by 10, so I use it often to cut yardage into either five-inch strips to then subcut into five-inch by five-inch squares or for 10-inch ones. Okay, so what were we saying? This was three inches by six and a half, so here's how I would do it. My way of cutting, and I was going to skip this step, but I'm going to walk you all through exactly how I think of the math to do it, okay? So three by six and a half. The first thing I'm going to do is see, is this a longer measurement or is this a longer measurement? Because I'm always trying to make the most efficient cut to where it will eliminate having these off little legs of the fabric, if you will, that are sticking out all over. So if I look right here, this measures eight inches, okay? And if I measure the other side here, this measures nine. Okay, so eight is less than nine, but eight is also bigger than six and a half. So I know that I can comfortably cut my six and a half inch length from this way, and that means that I can just go three inches up from this direction. Okay, so here's what I do. If this is a straight cut edge, we said three inches, I'm going to position the three inch line on my ruler right on that cut edge, Make sure it goes all the way up. It's perfectly straight. That's it. I just follow this right side edge and I cut. And I cut if it doesn't get hung up there. So if this was not missing from here, I would still have a solid rectangular piece of fabric. 
I don't have any weird little cuts left over, right? So that's what I do. I subcut once first. Now, remember we said this measured eight inches and I only need six and a half. Well, I'll come in in the other direction now and position the six and a half inch line of my ruler on this edge and then I can cut. So I have this little bit left over as a scrap that you can save if you want to do little scrappy zippered pouches and projects like that, but it's not connected to my solid chunk of fabric here, like sticking out, okay, getting in my way. I can separate this and put it in its own little scrap stash. And then what I had underneath my ruler is really easy for me to double check and make sure that I'm making the right cuts because exactly the chunk that's underneath my ruler is the piece I want, right? I can see three, six and a half. I cut it right. That's the piece I need for my project, and that's it, okay? So this stuff here where people are like, and then they'll like turn it. Oh, it drives me wild, though, because, you know, I'm like a cutter. Or sometimes here's what I also see is if this edge is not straight, instead of straightening it off, they'll come in a little bit of a ways and say, well, I need four inches by three, let's say. So they'll come in so that they're not on that crooked edge and say like four inches and then like go like this and measure three and like make a mark and try to, it's a lot. Just cut a strip to one measurement from whatever dimension can accommodate that length, turn it and subcut it to whatever you need, okay? Instead of having all this, because guess what happens too? And I know y'all have done this, where you go to pull a fabric from your stash and you're like, oh, I think it's the perfect size for what I need. And then you grab it and you see this. And you're like, no, I have cuts and slits in here. Now the size is smaller than what I can use, right? This right here would never go in my scrap stash. I, I can't have this. I literally will need to come in here and just get rid of it first and clean it up so I have solid, continuous chunks of fabric that I can work with in my future projects. All right, so let's see. And I was outside this morning. My allergies are killing me, but let's see. Um, Patrice says, I have two of the five inch by 10 inch rulers because one of the corners chipped off. It still works though. It happens. You know how these rotary cutters, we end up over time chipping off little bits of the acrylic from, from our different rulers. It happens to me. I have a lot of rulers like that too. All right. Um, Patrice says, I sometimes have issues with the rulers moving too, even when I use a five pound dumbbell. So the rulers moving, or excuse me, the rulers moving on you it's kind of like something that needs to be worked on based on your positioning also. For me, if y'all have seen me, I will say if I have a large piece of fabric, I'll go like this. If I'm working with a longer piece than the size of my ruler, I go, let me set myself up here. I go two inches and then I'll go like, I slide my ruler when I'm checking the measurements. And that's just what I prefer. So there are, let me see if I have it here. I do have a little pack. There are these little things called true grips and they're these little non-slip adhesive rings. We sell these in the shop. I'm not sure if we have them in stock or not, but if we have them in stock, you can get 20% off. No coupon code needed this week. You basically peel these off and you would stick them to the back of your rulers and they help keep it from slipping, okay? Unless it's something that's like a curved piece or like a template where I'm going to be cutting all the way around, I don't really use these on my everyday cuts because of what I just mentioned. I like to slide my ruler. So if I'm measuring here, I will literally like slide it up. I mean, usually when I have two rulers, but I like them to slide so I can check my measurement the full way. The trick comes in for me, at least for holding the ruler down is holding it more centered to where you're cutting. So if you're using like a really long strip ruler, you're not gonna start with your hand here and cut and then think that the rest of the length of the ruler is gonna maintain the edge nice and straight while you're pushing on it, especially with the blade, because oftentimes as you're cutting, you can go like that and kind of scoot the ruler over as you're cutting. So it's all about walking your fingertips up. If you've taken classes with me in person, you know that I always say that. We walk, walk, walk so that as the rotary cutter is running next to that ruler, our hand is somewhere there centered to hold it steady in place, okay? All right, let me see. Um, Sally says, I trim for my stash too. I'm telling you, I can't have all these little bits, no way. <laughs> Sticking out there. Okay, 
Oh, JC Louis says, I spray adhesive on the backside of the ruler and it gives it some grip so it doesn't slide on the fabric. I've never tried that, but that is very, very interesting. And actually, I think that's the first time I've heard of anybody doing that. Interesting. So like a temporary spray adhesive on the back of the ruler to then give it some grip to help it stay. That sounds actually really doable, like workable. Okay. Uh, let's see. Yes. Oh, Jamie was the one that was telling me to mention the true grips to help the rulers from sliding. So for those of you that do need that, this is an option and they're replaceable. Like you can peel them off, stick them on, stick them back on. I used to have some stuck here to the edge of my cutting mat um, so that when I do need it in a certain area, then I would have it there. But for my regular cuts, I don't really use it. But if you need that, um, <laughs> it's definitely something that can help. Okay. Yes, yeah, Susie's saying that what she loves about my ruler is that each line uses a different marking and there's no confusion keeping on the same line. Uh, I also use it every time I need to mark a quarter inch because of the way that it's marked. And so for those of you that are new to my rulers, the dashed lines on here allow you to see the fabric through the dashes. So where there's no actual marking, you see the edge of the fabric. So it makes it really nice and accurate to see the edge of the fabric where the line is not. And then the same way I was talking about the lines on the cutting mat here being a little bit thick, I know that I especially have a lot of rulers. Um, they're kind of stashed over there. But I have a lot of rulers where the lines and the markings are a lot thicker. So it's really tricky to see sometimes is the... Is the edge of the fabric right on the line? Is it to the left of the line? Is it to the right side of the line? Where is it? And we know that in quilting especially, that comes in very handy, like you need to have it be accurate. So that's one of the reasons that the printing or the screen printing on my rulers is super duper thin, okay? I did that on purpose because as a quilter, I know what I need and definitely what we would prefer, okay. Oh, awesome. Windless Original says, I learned the two ruler method in your first quilt club. I joined. It's such a game changer. Well, I'm glad to hear that. And that was what I was mentioning here to y'all that I use one ruler to measure and one to cut. Okay. All right. So let me move on from that. So again, what I would say, and I know some people are going to say like, I use my mat to cut. That's fine. For me, I love cutting, but when I need precision cutting, I'm going with rulers every day of the week. If I need to rough cut something, I can easily, in a pinch, use the cutting mat, the markings on the cutting mat to cut. Rough estimates, but for precision, I definitely use my rulers. So hopefully that helps. And it's just going to take time. You got to practice. You got to practice making the cuts, practice the measurements. Another thing about my rulers is I have a black dot down here that I call the zero corner. The measurements, they count up this direction from that dot, and they count up this way. So Instead of using a corner that would be like this opposite side where, okay, I know that the ruler is five inches. So if I line it up the cut edge of my fabric with the two inch mark, then that doesn't mean that this is two inches, right? Because we're counting from the end of it. So that means that this is one inch, two inch, and this is actually three inch. So instead of you having to get confused or the potential to get confused counting backwards because the numbers count down from the five inch edge, I have this dot here so that you can orient it quickly. You just look for the one black dot on the ruler. That's the only place that it is. You position it and then you know from here to here is two inches, from here to here is nine. So the measurements count up in this direction from the dot and up in this direction. So you're not having to go, okay, five minus three, that's two. And then I'm measuring it at two and we know how that ends up, right? We end up making wrong cuts. So I orient it this way so that that dot is in my bottom right hand corner because I'm right hand dominant to do this. So wherever you see that dot, you know that the measurements are going up and up from there, okay? All right, great. Now, the last uh, question I have here is about zippers. So let me scoot this out the way. And the question is from Lori. Lori had asked, when you cut off a long zipper, how can I reuse the remainder instead of throwing it away? Can I buy another zipper pull to fit it so that I can use it in another project? Or how do I know what to buy and where to buy it? Thanks so much. Love your courses and tips. Awesome. Well, you're welcome, Lori. I'm glad you like them. Let's talk zippers. I have a couple of number three craft zippers here. I also have some zipper by the yard tape. This is number three. Smaller, smaller teeth, narrower tape. This is a number five, wider zipper tape, larger zipper teeth, okay? They all have their numbers. I've done several episodes on Whip Wednesday here uh, talking about zippers and all that. So for this, I just wanted to kind of 
go over a couple of the things that I would recommend you do if you're trying to conserve the length of your zipper tape, okay? For a number three craft zipper, here's one. I went ahead and cut the zipper, uh, the metal stop off of this end, and it has the zipper pull that came on it, okay? So green, it matches green. This is a YKK zipper. What I do also, as we've discovered uh, this in um, one of my previous mini bag clubs, is that just because it's the same manufacturer doesn't mean that the zipper pull will fit, even though it's a number three craft zipper. So this one, for example, on the back of the zipper pull says YKK 3C. Okay, this one came off of this yellow one, and it says YKK 3C also. Now, the rest of these, where's the other one? This is an aqua zipper pull that is off of a number three zipper that is also YKK, but on the back of this one, it says 25U. Now, I have managed to forcefully put this one on this zipper tape, but it doesn't go on smoothly. It doesn't have the same markings on it, like it's not the same type of zipper pull. So yes, to answer um, Lori's question, yes, you can use and preserve the rest of the zipper tape that you have because you can get other zipper pulls and slip them on so that you can make it a workable zipper. But you need to make sure that they match. So usually if you're buying the zipper tape either by the yard like this or um, just whatever, number three or number 4.5, number five handbag zippers, you'll need to ask whoever you're buying them from if they have or sell extra zipper pulls that match the tape that you have bought, okay? So let me show you what I mean. This zipper, this zipper, YKK, they both came from the same batch. So say you're making a little wallet and it requires like five inch zipper chunks. You'll cut here, okay? Say you're, you're doing one little zippered pocket inside of a bag and it calls for that. And now you have this whole chunk left over. Well, in order to make it a working zipper, you want to have a zipper pull that will fit it. And because this has the same markings as this, I know that I'll easily be able to put this one on. We often will do this too, just to swap out the zipper pull and add a pop of color. Cause look how cute that yellow on the green will look. You can swap out the zipper pulls from the same batch of zippers too. To get it on here, there's a lot of different little tools. Some people use forks, some people use these like towel hanger things. So there's even like a little notion on the market to sell them. I have done so many of these y'all. It's not even a big deal anymore for me. Um, to just get it on there. I put in the tape on each side about halfway in, and then I just push it down. I keep the zipper teeth a little bit closed here as I slide this down, and that's it. It's already on there. It's so easy. It just takes practice, okay? And part of it also is like when you're first doing it, you don't really know how to manipulate the zipper tape, and so you end up fraying the edges here quite a bit. So that's why I had this lighter. So I will just singe the end of the zipper tape here because it's um, synthetic. So it's just gonna melt down and it's gonna seal the raw edges of that zipper tape and keep it from fraying. So I would do the same thing to the other side, especially if I'm adding zipper pulls to different zipper by the yard chunks. As I'm preparing things for the kits for this uh, weekend's retreat, I went ahead and prepped and cut all the zipper tape by the yard. Uh, yeah, zipper tape by the yard for the kits. You can see here, these are a couple and I'll do the same thing, I'll go back in here, and wherever it is fraying, I will just kind of melt that down to keep it from fraying further. Now, if this is gonna be like your first or second time um, putting a zipper pull onto a zipper tape, no matter the size, what I would do is cut it a little bit bigger, okay? So for example, say I need to put zipper pulls on one of these. Okay, I would cut it longer than what I need to give myself a bit on the end to accommodate maybe a little bit of fraying, maybe having a little bit of a tough time trying to get the zipper pull on here. But obviously this is the same color, so I definitely know this one will go on. Again, I just put it in halfway, halfway on each side, and that's it. Then I just push it in and then slide it down. And it's on, okay? So really easy, same thing. This guy can go on this one because like I mentioned, it's categorized as the same from the same batch. And it just takes practice. I know some of you are looking at me like, uh, you don't know how long I've struggled to, to get these zipper pulls on. Um, it's really not hard though.
Look how cute that looks. I love it with the pop of color from the zipper pull. Uh, Clovis says, I use a fork or by hand. Yes, some pe there's different little tools to do it, but if you don't have anything like that and you don't really know how to use it, just try it like this first. Again, give yourself a little bit of room there for it to kind of fray, and then just melt it down so that you know it'll hold and won't fray anymore, okay? All right. Um, Joan is saying, how do you know the number of zipper? So the number classification of the zipper, one, it should be listed on wherever you're buying it from. Two, if it's just a craft zipper like this, chances are it's a number three. The zipper tape itself measures one inch wide. On the number five, often called handbag zippers, the zipper tape measures one and a quarter inch wide, and the zipper teeth are a lot bigger. So if we have a look at some of these zipper pulls, these are all for number five and number 4.5 zippers. There's no way that you're going to get this huge thing on a number three craft zipper because it's just going to slide right over and the zipper is not really going to be working. Do you see how it goes over, but it's not closing it? It just glides over because it's huge for the size of the zipper teeth. Okay. So you got to make sure that you have the right size and from the same manufacturer. Okay. So just check with, you know, whatever the source is that you're purchasing it from and see if you can order a little baggie with assorted uh, zipper pulls and colors that will go with the same tape that you've purchased. Okay. All right. And that's it. That's the last question I had here. Hopefully these tips have helped some of y'all and that you'll try them out on some of your future projects. Remember that because my birthday is tomorrow and I'm turning the big four zero. We're running my half birthday sale because I feel like I'm 20. So 20% 20 off the entire shop except for sewing machines. Everything else, physical and digital products is 20% off. You don't need a coupon code. It will automatically or the discount will automatically be applied to your shopping cart. And that 20% off site wide sale is valid until Sunday. Uh, what are we? June 4th at 1159 p.m. Eastern Daylight Savings Time. Okay. So thank you everybody. Oh, Janice says, wow, now I want to swap all of my zipper pulls. I love the different colors together. It's a super fun way just to add an extra little pop of color to your project. So I hope you'll give that a try Janice for sure. All right. Well, thank you everybody for tuning in. I appreciate all the birthday wishes, safe travels to those of you coming down for our bag making retreat this weekend. And I will see y'all next week for another episode of Whip Wednesday.